All right, perfect. Uh, so good afternoon. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, my name is Eric Nielsen. I'm with NASA Langley Research Center. That's on the east coast of the United States. Um, I work in the area of computational fluid dynamics, so basically predicting aerodynamic performance and its interaction with other disciplines such as space vehicles and aircraft and so forth. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about some of our recent work um, with GPU architectures and uh, some of the programming models. Um, but first of all, I want to first of all say thank you to NVIDIA for having us here today and uh, thank you definitely to all the people who have been a part of this work. Um, so uh, Aaron and myself are at NASA Langley, uh, Professor Zubair and his student Jason are at ODU. Um, Justin here at NVIDIA has been an invaluable resource over the last several years, so I definitely thank NVIDIA for making him available to us over the last several years. Um, John Walbeer is uh, with DOD, and uh, John Linford is with Paratools, who specializes in a lot of performance analysis and things like that. So um, we're very grateful all, for all these people's contributions over the last few years to what I'm going to show you here briefly today. Okay, um, let's jump right in. Um, the solver that we're dealing with is, is known as Fun3D. It's an unstructured grid solver. Um, and it's very widely used across NASA as well as outside NASA for any number of different projects. Um, so certainly for things like space launch. For, so for example, this picture here on the far left, this is a, what's known as our launch abort system. Um, one thing we learned uh, during the shuttle program is we need to keep that crew on top of the stack. So in the event of an emergency during ascent, we can actually uh, fire these motors and actually carry the crew off to safety uh, if there's an emergency during launch. Um, this is a very uh, expensive simulation. One of these simulations about 30 million CPU hours to get uh, an answer that's not even all that great. This is really tough physical phenomenon here with these plumes interacting with the sides of the launch vehicle. Um, this is a full aeroelastic simulation looking down this stack. So we launched this vehicle one time um, towards the end of the Bush administration. Uh, it, it has since been turned into the Space Launch System program by President Obama. But uh, this is actually full-scale motion of this very slender vehicle uh, during flight. So uh, it's a very aeroelastic, uh, very multidisciplinary problem. Um, air acoustics. So in the design of commercial uh, airplanes today, uh, airframe noise, or, or noise in general, is a first-order driver for designing new aircraft today. So uh, can we shrink the footprint around an airport, for example? Um, unfortunately, that comes with very expensive uh, HPC requirements. So this is another simulation on the order of 50 million hours, just to get a rough uh, approximation to all the time and space scales involved with something like that. Uh, we're also involved with a lot of DOD applications, uh, things like this. Um, this is an interesting story. Um, we're going to launch this lander next year to Mars. It's called the InSight Lander. And very early on, they decided they were going to send this lander to a location on the surface that is one of the windiest locations on the surface of Mars. And what they were actually concerned about was, will there be enough wind to actually grab these solar panels and actually flip the lander over and kill the mission? Um, and so we did a lot of uh, risk mitigation work with with air elastic simulations to be able to um, understand what was going to happen there. And then finally, uh, SpaceX uses the, the code as their primary uh, aerodynamics package. And so if you haven't watched these videos on YouTube, go, go check them out. Basically, their first stage that just comes falling out of the clouds and then settles real gently down on this barge in the middle of the ocean. It's pretty fascinating. But all their aerodynamics is basically done with the code that I'll be uh, talking about here today. Now. Why are we in this? Why do we want to be looking at GPU acceleration? Well, we have a lot of tough technologies that we need to understand the physical phenomena. And something like GPU acceleration will help us to do that quicker uh, or to a higher fidelity or both. So something like supersonic overland flight, um, NASA is very um, uh, focused on this particular project right now. We're looking at uh, getting back to something like a supersonic business jet, kind of back to the Concorde days. but. Uh, we've developed the computational tools now to essentially mitigate the, the effects of boom at the ground level. We can actually fly these aircraft very, very quietly now. And so we're actually building a demonstrator over the next few years that we will work with the FAA to rework uh, the, the um, FAA reg regs to actually allow supersonic overland flight. But we can't do that with a lot of high-end HPC to be able to design such an aircraft. This is another interesting um, case here that I'll show you before we dive into the, into the GPU stuff. Um, when we go to Mars, you guys might have saw the Curiosity rover that we sent to Mars a few years ago. It's about the size of a VW Bug. That's about the biggest mass that we can safely decelerate before we reach the surface of Mars. Okay, So we're limited by the amount of drag that the uh, conventional aeroshell can provide coming through the Martian atmosphere. 
So we have to like, come up with additional technologies to augment the aeroshell drag, such as supersonic retropropulsion. And so this is a wind tunnel entry here, or a simulation of a wind tunnel entry, where we've got the forebody of the capsule, and we shoot basically retropropulsion jets out the front. Uh, they're, they're supersonic. You get very complex flow physics in the front here. And essentially the capsule, at this point in time, we don't know how to control the capsule. It essentially goes unstable at this point. And so we have a lot of computational work that is needed to understand flow physics like that. And so that's why we're here looking at GPU acceleration for uh, our CFD solver. Okay, uh, the collaboration I'm going to um, describe, uh, or the people who have contributed to it over the last uh, several years. Uh, Alphabet Soup kind of here from the NASA side, but again, ODU, a lot of help from NVIDIA and Portland Group in recent years. Uh, DOD has helped us with a lot of um, uh, support as well. The Paratools guys, University of Oregon, and finally, we've been very active participants in the Oak Ridge hackathons that uh, Oak Ridge and NVIDIA have sponsored, so we're very grateful for those uh, types of events. And we also organize our kind of our own informal hackathons. Every few months, we get together out on the East Coast and, and do things uh, in a real kind of fast-paced environment. Um, <clears throat> we have a bit of a storied history with trying to do GPU, ex G GPU acceleration of our uh, kernels. Um, in the past, we've had limitations in the programming model um, and some of the earlier hardware that just couldn't seem to compete with the traditional CPU technology. So we've been at this for six, seven, eight years. Um, but just in the last, I would say, six months, we feel like we may have turned the corner on things. And that's kind of the result of a couple of different new approaches. So some of the newer hardware that NVIDIA is putting out, uh, Pascal and Volta, um, really seem to uh, provide a lot more capability, certainly in terms of memory bandwidth. Um, and then we've coupled that, now we've gone straight CUDA for our programming model. And so there's a lot of advantages uh, that we can leverage there at a very low level in the implementation. And so we're now seeing perhaps a very compelling alternative to traditional CPU-based computing uh, for our CFD needs at NASA. Okay, so let's dive a little bit. Uh, it's going to be a high-level presentation. We're happy to talk afterwards about some of the details, but essentially Fun3D solves the Navier-Stokes equations of aerodynamics uh, using an implicit time integration scheme. It's a very common approach in general in CFD solvers. So you're essentially looping some number of time steps. You're constructing uh, a right-hand side. Some linearized form of that right-hand side goes on the left, and then you solve essentially like a quasi-Newton method to update your nonlinear solution and come back around and repeat, right? Wash, rinse, repeat thousands of times until you get convergence. Um, <clears throat> on an unstructured grid, this gives rise to a large block sparse system of linear equations. And so that's really been the root of a lot of our work over the last few years. Um, and here, what I'm going to talk about here is two kernels that um, we've focused on a lot. Um, and they're the largest drivers to CPU to runtime. So these two kernels are about 75% of a typical job uh, running Fun3D. The first kernel involves um, construction and storage of the compressible viscous flux Jacobians. And so essentially linearizing the discrete uh, form of the governing equations into matrix form uh, and assembling them into memory in an efficient way. And then kernel two is essentially our linear relaxation that we use to solve or at least again an approximate solve for AX equals B. And so those are the two kernels I'm going to talk to you about uh, for the next few minutes. And essentially the CUDA implementations that we've kind of arrived at for those two kernels. Okay, so we'll talk about the first thing, the, the, the viscous flux Jacobians. Essentially, uh, what we've got here is a loop over all the cells in the grid. So a cell is like a tetrahedron, for example. And we're going to loop through all those elements in the grid. And we're going to gather data from the corner points of those elements and then essentially build up some physics and then send results to this matrix uh, into rows and columns corresponding to those uh, grid points within the element, right? So essentially, um, we've got uh, updates to this. We split it into a diagonal and an off-diagonal set of contributions to this matrix. But basically, several loops over the number of edges, faces, and nodes within the current cell uh, basically a set of nested loops in here, and we'll dive into this on the next chart. But essentially the parallelization, you, one approach you could take is to simply parallelize over the number of cells, okay? So put each cell on its own thread, okay? And you could think about parallelizing that way. Uh, but along the way, you'll realize that you need atomic updates, right? So because of neighboring cells and the way the matrix gets constructed, it's a continuous scheme. So uh, you essentially have race conditions at interfaces between elements. And so you have to use some form of atomic updates when you're updating your matrix elements. Basically, you have race conditions to deal with. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> some of the other challenges involved, you've got to tra traverse this very uh, irregular, unstructured grid. It kind of comes with the territory. Uh, so uh, part and parcel that goes with that, irregular memory accesses kind of all over the place. Uh, a lot of complexities related to the underlying physics. Uh, there's a lot of uh, code just associated with the actual physical equations. And then a large number of variables and temp arrays that end up resulting in cache and register pressure along the way. OK, so initially what we did was just that. We put uh, each individual cell on a thread, and we used atomic updates to uh, update our matrix uh, entries. Uh, along the way, we found uh, we, we could do a lot of algebraic refactoring of some of the baseline code. And I think this is common across many core code development in general, that as you're doing the many core development, you often find optimizations that come back to your baseline code. And that was indeed the case for us. So even uh, though we were do focused on the many core on the GPU development, along the way, we actually realized a 2x and Xeon speed up as well. So I think that's pretty common um, for most people doing this type of, of, of effort. Um, <clears throat> We did end up using shared memory uh, along the way for a few critical temp arrays, but basically the bottom line was uh, each thread ended up still requiring a lot of temp arrays and a large number of registers, um, and we weren't real thrilled with this first pass on, uh, as far as performance goes. So where we went from there, <clears throat> I've kind of exploded this loop a little in a little bit more detail. I'm not going to speak to it a whole lot, but essentially we've gone after much more concurrency within this loop over cells. Basically, we've gone to threads within some of these nested loops. Okay, so we've basically parallelized around these inner node loops. So in a tetrahedron, you've got four nodes within the tet. And so we'll actually sp spend as many as four threads doing that work. Um, and then you've got to go over faces within the cell, edges within the cell. We actually collapse one of these doubly nested loops here and then basically thread this node within the cell here. And at the end of the day, we found that got us what we really needed in terms of performance. So we had a much higher number of active threads, uh, much improved thread utilization, um, much better coalesced memory accesses um, was a big, big uh, payoff for us. Um, we vastly reduced the register and the shared memory pressure and, and uh, essentially increased the occupancy a, a, a lot, a considerable amount. And then... Um, we basically enabled some reduction in the inner loops using shared memory within each SM. And, and finally, uh, we were actually able to wire up uh, a crude form of auto-tuning around the whole thing to essentially set, uh, to essentially pick some of these um, uh, thread, thread block, block sizes and so forth. So uh, we were quite happy with where that ended up. I'll show you some performance numbers in a second. Now, uh, let's switch to the other, uh, the other kernel that I wanted to talk to you about, and that's our linear relaxation scheme, okay? Um, like most um, unstructured grid or finite element codes, the mesh is typically renumbered, to, uh, for example, to minimize bandwidth. So pick some point in the field, call that mesh point one, call his neighbors two, three, and four, call them na their neighbors five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so forth. That essentially minimizes the bandwidth of your system. It also gives you much better uh, data locality in terms of grid-based operations. Now, when we look at our multicolor point implicit sweeps that we use to solve AX equals B, or at least to get some approximate solution, uh, that kind of flies in the face of this numbering. Okay, so the very nature um, of the coloring scheme is, is to have no two adjacent unknowns in the same color. Okay, so algorithmically that's very nice. Um, and within each color, we carry no loop carry dependencies. It's basically a block Jacobi within each color. But in terms of memory accesses, it really stresses the system now because uh, by design, by design of the multicolor scheme, you're now hopping uh, to do all the red unknowns all at once. You're hopping all over the grid. To do all the black unknowns, you're hopping all over the grid and so forth. So you have very uh, disjoint memory accesses. And so what we do, and we've done this for many, many years, even on the CPU side, is we carry around an additional mapping, basically, for all of our linear algebra. Okay, So we essentially uh, renumber our mesh for the linear algebra routines such that everybody within a color appears right next to each other in memory. Okay, So basically we go to stride, at, stride 1 everywhere on a CPU, for example. So all the red unknowns are grouped together, the black, the green, and the blue, instead of hopping around kind of willy-nilly across the whole mesh. So this kind of lets us have our cake and eat it too. And at the end of the day, we can map that solution from this map space back into physical space to update the, the actual physical non linear solution, okay? So now some of the GPU details. <clears throat> Essentially, we've got two loops here. We've got a loop of sweeps over the whole AX equals B problem. And then we've got a sweep over colors, uh, basically what I just showed you. And within each color, 
Basically, you've got two motifs. You've got a very uh, block sparse mat uh, matrix vector product, and then basically forward substitution of very dense blocks on the diagonal. Okay, so what we did initially here was to adopt some existing Ku sparse library functions, Ku blas functions for the dense linear algebra. Um, and we got it all wired up and it worked, but the problem was uh, the performance didn't seem to be there for matrices that were representative of our, of our typical applications. We weren't real happy with the performance. And so uh, we went off and actually developed some optimized versions of these block sparse matrix vector products and forward backward, you know, triangular solves. And essentially I'll point you to a reference from last year's supercomputing in Salt Lake City. Um, uh, but basically, we're much happier with where that stands now. So let me cut to the chase now and, and uh, show you some performance numbers. Um, so first of all, our benchmark uh, is set pretty high. Um, so our benchmark is a dual socket Broadwell with 28 physical cores that we can optionally hyperthread out to 28 or to 56, I'm sorry. And so that's a pretty high bar. Moreover, the baseline code uh, has been optimized over literally decades by the folks in the blue booth down the way over here, some of our friends down there. So this is a pretty tall bar uh, to, to, to measure up to. Okay, and so I'm gonna normalize performance, performance per dollar and performance per watt based on that dual socket Broadwell, which is pretty representative of today's um, CPU technology. Um, I think I basically said everything here. Um, so the first comparison is against Pascal. On P100, we're seeing a factor of three in performance, uh, a factor of two in performance per dollar, and a factor of almost three in performance per watt. We were very, very happy to see that. Uh, those are very compelling numbers. And then uh, a few months ago, um, with uh, Justin and NVIDIA's help, we were actually able to evaluate these kernels on Volta. And these numbers are coming in very well. Uh, performance is now between seven and eight X, a dual socket Broadwell. Performance per dollar is over three and performance per watt is a pretty amazing six, factor of six over a dual socket Broadwell. Uh, and so we are very, very happy with these, where these numbers ended up. I think even Justin was a little happy where these, where, where these ended up at the end of the day. Um, and so, um, we are excited to move forward uh, based on this. We had been kind of in a rut for a few years in terms of those older programming models and older hardware, but we're now kind of going whole hog on some other kernels to actually evaluate um, objectively what could this really buy us in a realistic setting. And so that's kind of where we're at. And um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have some, or I may defer some of those to the NVIDIA guys. But thank you guys for your time. And if you saw anything you're interested in here, please come talk to me afterwards. We, we need all the help we can get. So thank you very much.